voyaging under sail, trading oversea with far countries, the sails fill and draw, the ship comes alive, the horizon beckons. This is how an adventure begins. Long ago, in northwestern Europe, in a part that's now Sweden, people carved their ships in rock. In historical times, a few hundred years ago, in the 18th century, ships were carved on gravestones. They and the men who owned them would be remembered forever. This is the story of a ship and her crew that have never been forgotten. The ship was called Göteborg. She was owned by the Swedish East India Company. She had completed two trading voyages to China. Her third voyage was ending, and with all sails set and drawing, she was entering her home port. And then the impossible happened. She ran onto an underwater reef. Her masts broke off, her bow was stove in, she filled with water, and she sank. Now we can dive down to the wreck. And this is what it looks like now. In the shallow water of the river estuary, outside the modern port of Gothenburg. Here in the mud lies one part of her story, among the ruins of her Harland cargo. The rest is on dry land, a part of Swedish history. Swedish trade to the west has always flowed down the Jöte River. 400 years ago, the town of Gothenburg and a fortress were built near the river mouth, not far from the open sea. During the European wars of the 17th century, Sweden became rich and controlled much territory. Later wars reached a turning point in 1709 in Swedish defeat by Russian forces at the Battle of Poltava. In 1718, in Norway, the Swedish king, Karl XII, lost his life in the course of a siege. This painting shows his final journey back to Sweden. In the early 18th century, long-distance trade between Europe and Asia was already well established. Silver from the Americas was used by Europeans to trade eastwards and traders were men of the world. A Scotsman called Colin Campbell had become a rich and influential trader in Sweden long before his death in 1757. He had been the first ambassador of the Swedish king to the emperor of China. His Swedish partner, Nicholas Sahlgren, was the son of a Swedish merchant who had traded extensively in Europe. And these two men began to discuss plans for a Swedish trading company to the East Indies. They worked together with a Swedish official, Hendrik Koenig, who was the same age as Campbell. Their plans went well. They won a monopoly on all Swedish trade to Southeast Asia and the islands. This document from 1731 is their letter of privilege. Their monopoly would run until 1746. Trade would increase and Sweden would be rich again. Exports would be iron, timber, ropes and tar. The ships would be built in Sweden and manned by Swedish crews. Their home port would be Göteborg. Imports to Sweden would be sold at auction in Gothenburg to turn profits into cash to finance new trade. The company's success filled the main harbor of Gothenburg with life, and the town remained an important northern center for more than a hundred years. Here, in the heart of the present-day town, the company's old headquarters now houses a museum. Beside it, by the waters of the old Canal Harbour, stands the church built by the important German community in Gothenburg. 
These buildings still recall the great days of trade with China. Now our story can begin. The 30-gun frigate hit 1743. In the Middle Kingdom in China, the Ming Dynasty is coming to an end. Canton, the great southern city and port, is one of the centers of international trade. Half a world away, Jöteborg makes ready for a long voyage. Many surviving documents tell us much about it. Her provision Jöteborg loaded a cargo for Spain. It included sawn timber, anchors, nails and other iron goods, rope and tar. All for shipbuilders in the Spanish port of Cadiz on the Atlantic coast near the entrance to the Mediterranean. By early March 1743, the ship was fully loaded and her crew of 140 men came on board. The pastor, Peter Holmertz, kept a diary. Monday, 14th March, 12 o'clock noon, raised the anchor. Lord God, bless this our long and hard voyage. At Vinga Beacon, the pilots left us. Wind, west, northwest. Jöteborg sailed due west and encountered a late winter storm on the North Sea. Four weeks out from Gothenburg, the ship reached Cadiz. Once there, it took only 18 days to sell her cargo. Payment was in silver, no less than four tons of it. Silver was at a premium in China, and this helped to make the long voyage profitable. Jöteborg took on provisions and set sail again. Her voyage was to last 30 months, or twice as long as normal. What was she doing during the time? Research and good luck have given us some of the answers. One clue is this coin which we found in the wreck early on in the excavation. It was issued by the Dutch East India Company for use in the Dutch trading areas in the East Indies, and perhaps it came from trade there. The National Archives in Holland gave more information. In early January 1744, the Dutch in Batavia, their station on the island now called Java, saw the ship and noted her size, armaments and crew and they noted that she sailed for China in May 1744. According to Holmertz, Jöteborg had reached Java in late August 1743. Then she'd sailed north towards the South China Sea. Four months later, she returned to Java, anchoring off Batavia in late December 1743. So, before the Dutch saw her, she'd spent nine months in the Dutch East Indies and the South China Sea. What was she doing there? Some things recovered from the wreck may be goods that the crew had acquired by trade. This Japanese plate, for example, might have been bought in the islands, for the ship herself never touched Japan. And this Chinese cockfighting plate may have been bought in the islands where cockfighting was popular. It was known in Europe too, but it was not a very respectable sport. Holmert's diary says little of what people on board were doing, and perhaps some future find will tell us more. By early June, often she was near the huge estuary of Canton, where three rivers meet. The approaches to Canton were well mapped by Europeans. Macau, a Portuguese harbour, lay to the west. Before reaching the narrows called the Tiger's Mouth, ships exchanged salutes with the shore and picked up a pilot for the passage to Canton.
the pilot came on board with the mandarins who administered the strict Chinese regulations. They measured the ship to calculate harbor dues. When Yotaborg reached the anchorage, her voyage of 40,000 kilometers was over. She joined ships from Holland, England, and Denmark. All were there to buy the attractive Chinese goods. The Chinese export trade was a monopoly in the hands of the merchants called Hongs. Trading began with offers of gifts, and then the real business could start. The most important and most profitable item was tea. Jöteborg bought and loaded no less than 370 tons of tea. It was tightly packed in wooden boxes, lined with lead and sheets of rice paper and it was stamped down hard to get in as much as possible. The heaviest goods were loaded first as ballast. Jöteborg took on 133 tons of Tutanag, a metallic alloy. It was also called German silver, and in Europe it was used to make ornaments and the like. Then she loaded porcelain, which was heavy and unharmed by water, in barrels, chests and baskets. She lay at Canton for about six months. By early January 1745, it was time for her to sail for home. Not all of Holmut's diary has survived, but on 1st February 1745, he recorded that Jöteborg crossed the equator near Indonesia. More of her homeward journey we don't know, but we can guess. Hard weather and a hard life for the crew. Holmuts records the deaths, mostly during the outward voyage, of 32 of her crew of 140 men. Two months later, early on the morning of 12th September, almost 30 months to the day since her departure, Jöteborg was back in her home waters. When the impossible happened, she ran aground on a notorious reef and the catastrophe was a fact. No one could explain it then. Can we do any better now? The company lost no time. It engaged a diving master and by 1747, he'd recovered about one-tenth of the tea and a quarter of the porcelain. Thanks to him, the company managed to make a profit of 14.5%, and the wreck was left to its fate. In the 1860s, about another 10,000 pieces of porcelain were recovered. In 1906-07, a further 4,500 pieces of porcelain and some bits of timber were recovered too, and it was thought then that nothing else remained. Current excavations started in 1984, when some amateur divers interested in marine archaeology made a survey of the site. In July 1986, diving preparations began. Some 20 young people from Gothenburg devoted all their free time to the work. In 1989, the bid is 12,000. Thanks to the Royal Swedish Navy, we could use the former fortress as our base. Our sponsors helped us generously with money and material. Even close to land, Working scientifically underwater is a complex business. We got results at once. In the upper layers of mud, 
we found masses of broken porcelain and a few complete pieces. All of it shone and gleamed as if freshly taken from the kiln in China. And in summer 1989, we uncovered large wooden constructions. They were part of the stern. We wanted to recover the whole stern and to see what it might conceal. And we succeeded. After 244 years on the seabed, parts of the ship came into harbour at last. This was the ship that had run aground and sunk in sight of home. Right at the end of the season, we found the first piles of unbroken porcelain. We had time to recover only some 30 plates. Then the summer's adventures were over. What's the aim of the Göteborg project? Well, among other things, to try to get her cargo ashore. It may be a bit late, but that's not our fault. But what about the ship herself? One day, a friend of mine said, we'll build a model of Göteborg. Good idea, I replied. How big? A meter or two? Not at all, he said, and laughed. Full scale or nothing. He so explained we hoped to that do he'd this. seen it in Holland. And next time we meet, you can sign on for a short voyage out to Winger and back, and you could see if the food on board has got any better. And if I'm at the wheel, I promise I won't run the ship aground.